Hi everybody, I hope you're doing marvelously well. In this episode, we're going to talk about how you can clean up a muddy mix. I decided I'd watch a couple of videos on the subject and see what I could find out there. And I realized, uh, much like the how to get proper low end video that we did a week or two ago, there was a lot of confusing information and it was focused on one or two different areas, but didn't bring the whole thing together. So this video is going to be about all of the issues that we get. What, what exactly is muddy? When somebody says to you, oh, your mix sounds muddy, what do they mean? What are they hearing? Well, typically that's one of two distinct areas and they are different. The first area is where the kick drum, the bass drum, as it were, lives, where the bass itself lives, whether it be an organic you know, stand-up bass, electric bass, sub bass, synth bass, whatever you want to call it. That's the first area that we need to address. And then the second one is the low mids. And actually, a lot of the time, it's the low mids that really make your mix sound muddy. So let's get in and talk about those two different areas and ways that we can solve it so you can have a really crystal clear mix with great definition and huge pumping low end. So firstly, great productions create great mixes. I know that might sound fairly obvious, but I do believe it is something that has disappeared off into the ether. If we go back, say, to times of recording, it was, of course, all about recording things live, wasn't it? There would be anywhere from, you know, three, four, five people in a room to big band to full orchestra. And right at the beginning, it was capturing in mono, let alone stereo. So one mic or multiple sources bust to one mic. Even when it got to stereo, the earlier stereo, there was a limited amount of tracks. So what, why am I pointing that out? Well, I'm pointing it out because if you had too much low end, too much low mids, you would move that instrument back further away from the mic if it was too muddy and too low midly. As simple as that. You had a limited amount of EQ. So why do I bring that up? I'm not the guy that's talking about a superiority here. It's not about that. It's about understanding that if we record things the way we want to hear them, there's less mixing involved. I know it sounds obvious. A really good illustration for that for me is the Beach Boys. If you get a chance to listen to any of the multi-tracks, not that I'm saying they're available, or even just listen to, say, pet sounds, you'll notice the, the genius of Brian Wilson was he would record instruments in frequency ranges. He would say, bass guitar and tambourine on one track. The Beatles did it as well because there was the low end and there was the high end on one track. Another track would have instruments that would fit around that. There was such a limited amount of things you could do with four or eight tracks that everything had to work because it was being bounced together. What those guys and girls did is they selected instruments and created parts that would work with each other. So if there was an instrument in a specific frequency range, they would commit to that, and when they would bounce multiple tracks together, they couldn't fix it later. They couldn't say, oh, there's too much low end in this piano with the left hand, and there's too much low end on the bass, now it's just mud. That was it. It was too late. It's bounced together. So it just points to a really straightforward thing. Great production will give you the ability to create great mixes. So what we need to do is choose sounds that are supportive of each other. Find a bass sound that maybe is all just sub. And then if you wanna add the grit, take that same maybe MIDI information that you've created to create the sub and trigger another sound. Or maybe take a bass guitar it's got some drive on it, either the amp's driving or you put some saturation or distortion on the bass and wipe off the low end and put the two things together. Don't take that bass guitar and expect it to be super full range and that sub and those two things to work together. They will fight each other. There'll be excessive amounts of low end. It's all about making smart decisions as you go along. 
rather than just recording, recording, and recording, putting tons of parts down, and then opening up your session on another day or later on and, and seeing that you have 142 tracks that all have extended low end and trying to make it all make sense. If you're making those decisions, even if it's just with plugins, it doesn't matter if you're committing because you can commit by opening a plugin and shaping the EQ. So here we have a sub. This is a keyboard sub, it's pure tone. I suggest listening on a really nice pair of headphones, something that's got enough of a full range. I mean, your headphones should be able to do it. Earbuds may not reproduce the low lows of this. Speakers, something to help you hear it. You won't hear it on laptop speakers or you might hear half of it. So here is the part. So there's a low A there, it's pretty, pretty low. And then we have a bass guitar here. So if we analyze the bass guitar for a second. The bass has got a lot, it's really dominating at around about 80 to 100 hertz. Let's listen to the sub, we'll clear this for a second. The sub is consistently hitting at about 70. Okay, so let's do one of two things. We'll go onto our bass guitar here, so I'll live bass guitar, grab an EQ. We'll engage this at 70. And now the bass, we well, can probably go a little higher actually, because you can see here, it's not that steep of a high pass, but now the bass is gonna have most of what's going on wiped off below. Uh, I'll use the Q function here to tighten it. Now let's put those two things together. It's great. I might do this more often. That sub is perfectly filling in that area. And uh, just for those of you who want to know, it's the Absinthe 5. It's a native instruments. There's probably plenty of other pure subs you can use, but those two things together is absolutely fantastic. So we're using our ears, but we're also using a frequency analyzer. Now we can go and bring up all the kick drums. So now I've soloed out the kick drums. We'll clear our frequency analyzer. Now this is quite typical, and we talk about this a lot with the low end, is there can be build up in certain frequencies. And again, in that 80 to 100 area where the bass is really living, there's quite a lot of that on the kick drum. Here's our kick bus. And as you can see, I'm pulling out about 110. So I'm gonna bring that down a little lower, to say about 100-ish, and I'm gonna widen the Q like this. I'm also here going to go a little lower, so to about 50, and widen the cue as well. And actually give it a little bit more of a boost. So now I've got a little bit more low lows going on in the kick. So I'll open this up a little bit, like so, and I'll widen this cut again even more. It's kind of a, a little bit of a... Whew. 
a little bit of a game here between the two. Okay, see how that feels. Nice. Bass. Bringing the sub. That's great. Now, there's logic going on there. We're logically shaping those things around each other. I wouldn't say it's math, but it's logic and we're using a tool. Quite often, let's be honest, you're working in environments where you don't have a sub or you don't accurately know how the low end is going to work. Now, one of the things that's obviously really important is that we have two different things at play here. We have a base sub, which is completely consistent. If I look, if you just listen to this on its own, listen to this bass sub. I mean, there's a slight initial attack of like a dB lift, but it's just like flatlining. This is the thing we'll have to remember. Number two, virtual instruments do not give you the same results as organic ones. When we soloed that sub bass and we soloed that electric bass, there's an enormous difference dynamically. This sub bass has a very slight attack on each one of those downbeats, but ultimately it's just a consistent volume the whole time. Let's go to our live bass. I mean, it's uneven in frequencies. It's, you know, we did quite a lot of fun things to it, but ultimately it needs maybe a little bit of an MV2 on it. This is a favorite plugin of mine because it controls the low level stuff and the high level stuff and pulls it together so there's a more consistent volume. Here we are, we've got the sub, which is just consistent. I didn't do any additional compression or EQ. It's a virtual instrument. It just delivers the same way every time. Even a virtual piano is gonna be recorded with a microphone in exactly the right place. And every hit is gonna be absolutely perfectly performed. You think of things like acoustic guitars or stand-up basses. Performers move. So when they play a note, it'd be like boom, they, they can hit it too hard, too soft, move slightly. Every time they're moving an inch or two, you know, a few centimeters here and there, the microphone picks up a completely different frequency response. Maybe not dramatically different, but a lot more different than a sub that's coming from a synth. So we have lots of different things to think of. And the MV2 is a very perfect plugin for me to get rid of a lot of those issues. So I'm gonna take the output down I'm going to bring up the low level. So now we have the frequency analyzer up and we're going to take the low level information and boost it. On that second note, that D, it disappears. The low end gets inconsistent. Have a listen again. So let's take the low level information here and bring it up. Then take the high, bring the output down. So there's a little bit missing in that kind of 110 area. So why don't we go to our old favorite, the R bass, we'll bring it up to about 100.
hasn't 100% alleviated every issue, but oh, it's, it's got infinitely better. Definitely far more consistent, nowhere near as consistent as the sub bass, as the programmed virtual bass. It's always going to be a completely different thing. So when you're watching, you know, a lot of those tutorials, and, and I watched many of them before preparing this, I realized that talking about virtual instruments, virtual drums, all of that stuff is one thing and very, very important. And you can get in there and get a little mathematical about how you separate all of your low end apart. But when it comes to either using entirely organic instruments or using organic instruments with program instruments, you have to play a bit more of a tougher game. You have to get in there and even some of that stuff out. If you want that bottom end to be really consistent in your mix, that's what we do. Three, so muddiness comes from two areas in particular, the low end that we're discussing here. And now that we've clarified and cleaned up the relationship between the kick drum, the bass drum, a live bass and a sub bass, and we've created some nice consistent low end in there, we've got to think about, well, what could be getting in the way? Now, I have a lot of guitars here. And these heavy ones here are pretty massive. But what we did here, as you can see, there's a high pass. It's actually at about 80. Now, what I like to do is I like to find the fundamental, something that sounds really thick at the bottom of those guitars and boost it and then cut in the same area. Meaning I can actually get more low fatness out of my guitars if I take more low end off, but increase it where it feels and sounds the best. So let's see if we can find where the low end really feels good on these guitars. So I narrowed the cue, we're at about 130, 135 hertz, and that boost is pretty dramatic. And it probably doesn't need to be that much, but let's have a listen again. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my high pass and move it closer to the boost. So now I'm high passing much closer to that. I'm high passing at 100 hertz. That's bypass. That's all the EQ off now. And it's like, well, wait there. Shouldn't it sound like there's more low end, Warren, because you just cut all that low end? No, it doesn't sound like there's more low end. It sounds fatter, like there's more low end because I found the fundamental of what makes that guitar sound really, really thick and boosted it and then cut everything below, which is unwanted and will get in the way of the bass and the kick, destroying the clarity and adding, yes, you guessed it, muddiness.
So less low end equals more a low end if you boost the low end that actually matters. Okay, so I'm gonna take that and actually, look at that. So now my slope is really drastic. Take a bit of that boost down, so it's not quite so drastic. I love it. So, but we've clear, cleaned it up, like at 100 hertz, everything is gone. And now we're at like 140. So let's say that feels like if we just drop in the sub. Bass guitar. Everything together. Smart high passing is really going to help the low end be bigger because you're getting rid of stuff that's unwanted and creating mud and you're finding fundamentals in your guitar sounds and boosting them or your synths or whatever it might be and just getting it so it feels like it's all gluing together and just sounds like, yeah, I've got definition down there. So you can see there it's a judicious use of high passing and boosting low end. We did it with the sub. We did it with the bass guitar, and now we're doing it with the guitar. And that is creating so much more bottom end. And we also went into the kick drum and boosted more of the fundamental of the kick and cut that area where the bass needed some room. And it gives us a bit of everything we need. So the fourth thing we need to talk about, the second area of buildup that causes muddiness is, of course, the low mids. Now, I find the first thing I do always is go to my drum kit and start looking there. Now, if we go to my overheads here, you'll see I cut everything, not dramatically, but everything about 160 and below. I've also got a lo-fi on there, so I'm distorting it. Let's have a listen. In and out of bypass, you can see it's high passing quite a lot, but I could get in there at about 350 here and pull that out as well. See there, without the EQ in, stodgy, put the EQ in. It's actually nice. There's more snap on the snare in the overheads and the cymbals don't sound affected at all. They're just breathing, the hi-hat, everything's great. I'm actually gonna cut even more low mid. Now, it's typical with things like low mids, et cetera, and low end to be removed from overheads. It doesn't have to be massively removed, but definitely EQ'd away. And also, reverbs. So if I go to my toms, for instance, have a listen. Now, there's an EQ on the tom sub itself. Uh, actually, it could do with more. There's like a little bit of a cut here, but I can make that a little higher at about 350 and I could dip that quite dramatically. So this is a blend of the live ones with the sample. But, you know, I could add a bit of low boost on that. We could go to the R bass, for instance, and we could go up to about 100. Pass it. Great. Now I'm going to take the Tom sub itself and send it to the reverb. And what we're going to do is we're going to put an EQ before that reverb. It's kind of high and low pass. So this will get rid of that excessive low muddiness. It's another thing to do with your reverbs, is to high pass them above the low mids. 
especially the low end. The low end on a kick drum, I can go back and check it. I do not want that going into my reverb, or I'm just gonna have boom, boom, all these ambience delays and reverbs with too much excessive low end will just create a ton of mud. So I'm gonna go up to about, let's say 300-ish. I don't mind the high end so much, there's not, there's not much there, I don't, even, I don't even know if I have to. See, it's about 8K and it's gone. So we could do that, maybe. So if we go to about 8K-ish. But, see, here we are, about 300, all gone. Toms still sound great going through that reverb, but there's not gonna be any of that low mid and low build up. Throwing the whole drum kit. Great, super aggressive snare. We can do the same thing on our snare verb. We've got a little bit of compression going onto it, but we can go in and grab another EQ. Fantastic. Let's go to our kick bus, which we already worked on, and then have a look at our kick verb. It's already, uh, let's go a little higher. So we'll go, to, there you go. Okay, whole thing together. Craziness. So now we've created a lot of clarity in our low mids and our low end. We've gone in there, we've taken out areas that we don't need it in, which is in the drums in particular. On the ambience, we've taken out the low mids. We don't want all that boost of just brum, rumbling low mid and low end. Those are really all of the areas that we address to remove muddiness in a mix. And I think the important things are to remember are Virtual instruments and live instruments give you different sets of problems. Virtual instruments, by virtue of the way that they're recorded or created synthetically, are a lot more consistent. And that is a wonderful thing. It will make EQing and compressing very easy. You may not have to do as much compression. And if you're working in MIDI and there is uneven performances, you can go in there and even them up on your MIDI information and still keep that same response on every single hit. Now, with organically recorded stuff, with microphones, with players moving, with all kinds of issues that can come from that, you're going to have to get more creative. But that's the challenge of those two elements coming together. And it's, it's a great one, but there is no one size fits all approach. I believe strongly that you should make decisions based on what you hear and then use the tools in front of you to achieve that. And for me, listening to the song, I was thinking, well, I want my kick to be massive. I want my sub to be enormous, but I don't want it to just turn into like exploding out of nowhere. It has to be controlled just enough. And that I believe is what we achieved here on this course. Great, so if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below. I love being able to talk about this stuff. I know that the moneyness and the low end issues are something that consistently comes up in conversation. So please, if you have any tips, you have any ideas that you want to share with people, any of your experiences, please do below. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing and I really, really appreciate everything that you do. Please go to producelikeapro.com. You can sign up for the email list, get a whole bunch of free information. And thank you for being uh, truly marvelous. Mm -hmm.